Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's webcast, Advanced Thermal Management Solutions, Heat Pipes, Pumped Systems, and Thermal Storage, sponsored by Advanced Cooling Technologies and Tech Briefs Media Group. I'm Billy Hurley, Associate Editor with Tech Briefs Media Group, and I'll be your moderator today. Our webcast will last approximately 30 minutes, and there will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, you may submit it at any time during the presentation by entering it in the box at the bottom of your screen. Our presenters will answer as many questions as possible at the conclusion of the presentation, and those questions not addressed during the live event will be answered after the webcast. Also, twice during the presentation today, we will present you with a poll question, which we invite you to answer at the appropriate time. In order to view the presentation properly, please disable any pop-up blockers you may have on your browser. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Pete Witt is Vice President of Technical Services for Advanced Cooling Technologies. Pete joined Advanced Cooling Technologies in 2010 to head ACT's technical services business. During this time, the group has successfully provided thermal consulting, design, and prototyping solutions to, cus to commercial customers in the lighting, renewable energy, industrial equipment, and medical industries. Also on the line today for the Q&A is Rich Bonner. Rich, manager of custom products, has been with ACT for over 10 years. He has served as principal investigator on over $10 million worth of government and industrial funded R&D programs. The thermal management topics have included two-phase heat transfer, heat pipes, nanoscale coatings, thermal storage, junction level cooling, and jet impingement. So now I'd like to hand the webcast over to our first speaker, Pete Ritt. Thank you, Billy. I'm Pete Ritt, and along with Rich Bonner, we are delighted to be with you today. Devices with increasing power and smaller footprints are demanding a good, stable, cost-effective thermal management solution, and many options are available today, including passive thermal management, pump systems, and thermal storage. Each of these has provided excellent thermal management for different applications. For device designers familiar with these technologies, determining which thermal management technology is appropriate for their application can be a challenging task. To help sort out the many options, in today's webinar, we'll provide an overview of three very different thermal technologies, passive heat pipes, pump two-phase cooling systems, and temporary thermal storage slash phase change materials. We'll provide an overview of each of these technologies, explain how they function, and show some examples of when they should be considered. Let's start with heat pipes. Heat pipes are sealed vacuum devices. They are housed in a metal tube. Inside the tube is a wick structure and a small amount of a working fluid. Most applications are copper tube, copper mesh, and water, but there are several other envelope materials, wick structures, and working fluid combinations. Heat pipes are passive two-phase heat transfer devices that operate in a closed system. To work, a heat pipe must be in contact with a hot end or evaporator and a cold end or condenser, as can be seen in the schematic on the left. The delta T is the driving force for the heat transfer. The heat from the evaporator causes the working fluid to vaporize. The vapor then flows to the cooler end where it condenses to a liquid. The condensed liquid then returns to the evaporator by capillary force of the wick structure. In the schematic on the right, you can see a cutaway showing the heat pipe structure, including center vapor path and a liquid path along the wick structure. Let's now have a demonstration of the heat pipe. The metal tube sticking out of the center of the enclosure with the ACT logo on it is a standard copper rod. To the right of the rod is a copper water heat pipe. Both are painted with a temperature sensitive paint that is green when cold and yellow when warm. Both are connected to a cold thermoelectric below. The first step will be to move the copper rod from the cold thermoelectric to the warm one. You will begin to see the copper rod change color from green to yellow as it begins to heat up. We'll then move the heat pipe in the same way. As you see, the heat pipe heats up and changes color very fast. When the heat pipe is returned to the cold thermoelectric, it also returns to the green color. The copper rod does as well, but not nearly as fast as the heat pipe. Please go ahead and start.
I think that effectively shows the tremendous heat transfer capability of heat pipes. Can move on to the next slide. So now we know a little bit about heat pipe operation, let's look how this can be put to use. First of all, with different combinations of envelope materials, wick structures, and working fluids, heat pipes can be used over wide temperature range. From cryogenic to liquid metal, from minus 150 to 1,000 degrees C. Because they are sealed vacuum devices, some working fluids can operate well beyond their nominal boiling point. Water, for example, can be an effective working fluid from 20 to 250 degrees C. By controlling the amount of working fluid and selecting the appropriate wick structure, heat pipes can restart operation after freezing. That is, when a copper water heat pipe is subject to temperatures below freezing, it does not function as a heat pipe. However, when the temperature rises above freezing, they begin to operate normally. They are freeze-thaw tolerant. Also, with the right wick structure, heat pipes can operate against gravity. That is, they can move heat away from the hot evaporator, even when it is above the condenser. Typically, heat pipes can transfer 8 to 10 inches against gravity, although gravity-aided operation is generally preferred. In terms of advantages, since boiling and condensing are occurring at the same temperature, heat pipes can have effective conductivity of 10,000 to 200,000 watts per meter Kelvin. We can contrast that with copper, an often used conductor, which has a conductivity of around 400. In terms of heat flux capabilities, heat pipes can operate with heat fluxes up to 50 to 75 watts per centimeter squared, with custom wicks up to 500 watts per centimeter squared. One of the key benefits of heat pipes is heat transport. Heat pipes can be used to transfer heat to external sinks. They are capable of transferring heat over long distances with minimal delta T. We mentioned typical heat pipes can transfer heat 8 to 10 inches. Gravity-aided and other specialized heat pipes can transfer over longer distances. Bending and flattening enables increased geometric flexibility to designs. You can see in the picture on the lower right, heat pipes which are bent in three dimensions to transport heat away from an electronic component to a cold rail. Finally, heat pipes can be used to move heat away from the inside of, a, of an enclosure to exterior air cooling without subjecting the components to the outside environment. Next, we'll look at high K plates. High K, K for thermal conductivity. High K plates are metal conduction plates with embedded heat pipes in them. Heat pipes are pressed into grooves or drilled holes and soldered or epoxied into place. They offer similar strength and weight as the metal substrate, typically aluminum, with much higher thermal conductivities. They can be manufactured as thin as 72 thousandths. High K plates are often used to reduce hot spots or enhance fin efficiencies in air-cooled heat sinks. The highlighted area shows a thermal conductivity range from 500 to 1200 watts per meter K, which is much higher than aluminum at 180 watts per meter K. These values come from real-world application where ACT went back to our models and adjusted the bulk thermal conductivity of the plate until the hot spots matched tested results. This figure shows a comparison of an aluminum plate with the high K plate seen on the previous slide. In this example, the system was cooled using liquid cold rails. With an all aluminum plate shown on the left, conduction gradients created hot spot temperatures exceeding maximum electronics temperatures. Going to a copper solution was also not desirable due to weight concerns. However, using a high K plate, the heat pipes are seen as horizontal and vertical lines, Higher thermal conductivity performance was achieved over aluminum or copper without adding significant weight to the aluminum solution. In this example, over a 20 degree C hotspot temperature reduction was realized. At this time, we'll turn it back to Billy for a polling question. Thanks, Pete. It's time for our first poll question. It will appear on your screen now. The question is, when looking for thermal management solutions, what is the single most important criteria your company uses to decide? 
and your choices are A, cost, B, performance, or C, reliability. And you can make your choice by selecting the appropriate button on your screen. Again, when looking for thermal management solutions, what is the single most important criteria your company uses to decide, cost, performance, or reliability? And as you make your selection, I will hand the presentation back over to Pete. Pete? Thank you, Billy. Heat pipes, as we have seen, are superconductors of heat that require no power, produce no noise, and last for decades. We reviewed the basic principles of their operation, two-phase heat transfer inside a sealed device, which causes the heat pipe to isothermalize rapidly between the hot evaporator and the cold condenser. We discussed high K, high thermal conductivity conduction plates, in which by embedding heat pipes into aluminum, we can significantly increase thermal conductivity and provide improved heat transfer and heat spreading without increasing weight or decreasing structural strength. Next, we'll talk about pump two-phase cooling, which is an active cooling system that uses boiling and the latent heat of vaporization to provide excellent thermal management for challenging high heat flux applications. Let's discuss the basic principles of pump two-phase cooling. P2P uses the same core components as a traditional single-phase pump liquid system. It has a pump, an evaporator, a heat exchanger, and a working fluid reservoir. A key difference between pump single phase and pump two phase cooling is that the working fluid is close to its saturation temperature as it comes in contact with the hot device. The heat causes the working fluid to evaporate and heat is removed through latent heat of vaporization, which as we will see has some very attractive benefits. To explain a little bit more about pump two phase cooling, here is a clip from a video on our pumped two-phase or evaporative cooling systems use the same basic system level components as the pumped single-phase system. However, pumped two-phase systems typically use refrigerants as the working fluid. Through refrigerant selection and appropriate controls, the refrigerant is designed to boil as it acquires heat from the hot surface of the device. More heat can be removed through the boiling process, otherwise known as latent heat, than through sensible heat with single-phase cooling. Boiling across the entire evaporator surface offers a further advantage in that the evaporator will have a very uniform surface temperature, typically within a few degrees. Thermal transfer power of boiling of the working fluid as it moves along the evaporator can be quite advantageous and provide benefits in system efficiency and size. To help establish and clarify a better baseline, we'll now explore a little more some of the differences between pump single and two-phase cooling. Here is a chart that compares and contrasts key attributes of pump single versus pump two-phase cooling, which are the two most common thermal management technologies used to dissipate kilowatt or higher heat loads. In terms of heat flux capability, pump two-phase has significantly higher capability, with pump liquid systems typically in the 10 to 20 watt per centimeter squared range and pump two-phase from 300 up to even 1,000 watts per centimeter squared. Single-phase pump liquid systems have a variety of potential working fluid selections, including water, ethylene glycol, combinations of water and ethylene glycol, and refrigerants. Pump two-phase systems, which are closed and pressurized, are usually refrigerant-based, but can be used with water, methanol, or combined water-methanol systems. A real advantage for weight and space-confined application is the significantly reduced pumping power and flow rate requirements for pump two-phase versus pump liquid systems. We'll put some numbers to that on the next page. Of course, pump liquid solutions have been around for a long time, and these solutions are reliable and well understood. Pump two-phase is an emerging technology that, while a bit more complex, is finding applications in many new areas, and modeling capabilities for these systems is improving as well. To give a clearer sense of the flow rate and pumping power differences between pump liquid and pump two-phase systems, the following comparison is provided for an avionics application. In order to dissipate 80 kilowatts of heat, 
a pumped liquid system using PAO as the working fluid would require a flow rate of 35 gallons per minute and approximately 5.3 kilowatts of power. A pump two-phase system using R245FA would require only 6 gallons a minute and 250 watts of power, which is an 80% reduction in flow rate requirements and a 95% reduction in power requirements compared to a pump liquid system. A significant difference for sure. Let's now turn it back to Billy for a polling question. Thanks, Pete. Now it's time for our second and final poll question today. It will appear on your screen now. The question is, does your company currently utilize or are you considering using any of the thermal technologies discussed today? And your choices are A, yes, you use them now. B, you're considering using them in the next six months. C, you're considering using them in the next six to 12 months. Or D, you have no current plans to use them. So you can make your choice now by selecting the appropriate button on your screen. Again, does your company currently utilize or are you considering using any of the thermal technologies discussed today? And as you make your selection, I will hand the presentation back over to Pete. Pete. Thank you, Billy. Here are some real-world examples where pump two-phase cooling is being used. The first is high heat flux laser cooling. In this application, the high heat fluxes must be dissipated while maintaining tight temperature limits across the diode surface. We'll look at that in a little more detail on the next slide. Another example is cooling of parallel electronics boards for a pulse directed energy weapon application, which have both stringent isothermal requirements and size and weight constraints for better mobility. Finally, there is a power electronics example where high operational reliability of the electronics is required. In these applications, there is concern about water leaking. In addition, the ability to efficiently move waste heat away from an environmentally controlled room is another key thermal management benefit of pump two-phase cooling. Let's take a deeper look into the laser cooling application. Laser diodes typically require lots of power, most of which results in waste heat. Vertical cavity surface emitting lasers, for example, can have heat fluxes in excess of 500 watts per centimeter squared. Further, the heat loads must be dissipated while maintaining a uniform temperature across the evaporator surface. In many cases, pump liquid systems are not suitable for these applications. It is difficult or impossible to meet the isothermality requirements of a few degrees C, particularly when hundreds of laser diodes are involved. In these applications, a pump two-phase cooling solution is often appropriate. One can see an example of a pump two-phase evaporator in the lower right. Flow is from left to right, and one can see the bubbles exiting the evaporator. The formation of the bubbles as the working fluid passes across the hot device is an indication of evaporation occurring. Bubbling across the evaporator surface can provide the high heat flux dissipation and temperature uniformity required for the laser diode applications. Pump two-phase cooling offers the potential to address increasing heat dissipation requirements up to 1,000 watts per centimeter squared by some estimates, which air and pump liquid systems would be weight and power challenged to accomplish. Pump two-phase systems require only a small pump and can be designed to be compact and lightweight. We reviewed three applications where P2P systems are being implemented today, including a laser diode cooling, which have very high heat flux requirements and a very tight temperature range. So we anticipate that there will be additional pump two-phase cooling applications. ITBT cooling, hybrid battery packs are two potential areas. Finally, we'll talk about phase change materials and thermal storage. Solutions providing temporary thermal storage are in increasing demand for reducing heat sink size, providing a temporary fail-safe mechanism for active cooling systems and other military applications. Phase change materials, PCMs, operate using a phase change, in most cases, solid to liquid phase transition. During the phase transition, a material's latent heat increases dramatically, which allows it to store thermal energy for a given period of time. The major benefit of integrating PCM is that it will maintain a temperature during the phase transition. Depending on how much PCM is in your system and the power it is required to store, this storage capability can be a couple of seconds to several minutes. 
The key feature benefit of phase change materials is their specific heat C. Specific heat is the amount of heat slash energy that one gram of a material can absorb to raise its temperature one degree C. Units are in joule per gram degree C. Equations deriving specific heat from the power equation can be seen on the right. Q is heat, M is mass, and delta T is the temperature difference before and after. During phase transitions, these PCMs have significantly higher specific heat values, sometimes one to two orders of magnitude higher, meaning they can absorb a lot of heat without raising its temperatures. This can be seen in the graph on the right. The green area is the solid to liquid phase transition. In this regime, an external increase in temperature does not cause the PCM temperature to rise due to the high specific heat, as evidenced by the horizontal line showing essentially no temperature rise with increasing energy input. Let's put some numbers to this. Here is an example. After selecting the PCM, establishing the required volume, and designing the enclosure with proper fin and wall structure, the solution is ready to test. This, show, this slide shows a tested sample with the estimated properties shown to the left. The key takeaway here is that the main benefit of using PCMs is a large increase in the effective specific heat, that is the heat of fusion over this temperature range during phase transition. In this example, we went from 1,657 joule per kilogram degree K to over 60,000 between 72.2 and 75.9 degrees Celsius. Let's next look at some results. In this test, up, test setup, we applied slightly over 40 watts of total power with air at room temperature. If you're familiar with the PCM theoretical line, probably looks familiar. The module heats up until it reaches the PCM melt temperature. It can then hold within a few degrees of that temperature until nearly 100% of the PCM is melted. Once all the PCM is melted, temperature begins to rise at the same rate. In this case, the PCM heat sink was designed to absorb the heat load for about 250 seconds with some margin. The tested results match well and the theoretical temperature was never exceeded. There are several factors that need to be considered when selecting a phase chain material. An ideal, an ideal PCM will have a high heat of fusion, high thermal conductivity, high specific heat and density, long-term reliability during repeated cycling, and dependable freezing behavior. In this chart, green indicates attractive features, red indicates challenges. There are several classes of phase change materials. Paraffin waxes are the most common PCM because they have a high heat of fusion per unit weight, have a large melting point selection, depend, provide dependable cycling, are non-corrosive, and are chemically inert. When designing with paraffin PCM, void management is important due to the volume change from solid to liquid. Paraffin PCMs also have low thermal conductivity, so designing sufficient conduction paths is another key design consideration. Hydrated salts are another category. These PCMs have a higher heat of fusion per unit weight and volume, have a relatively high thermal conductivity for nonmetals, and show small volume changes between solid and liquid phases. These are less commonly used since they are corrosive and long-term reliability is uncertain. Other PCMs such as metallics, non-paraffin organics, and liquid to gas phase change materials are available, but tend to be used less for these applications. In general, there are three common problems that PCM solutions can solve. The first is simply heat storage. For one-time use applications, such as a missile, the PCM can be used as a standalone heat sink. When designed properly, it can maintain temperature below electronics failure temperatures. The PCM volume is determined by a combination of the maximum mission duration and power it must store. Oftentimes, a PCM solution can greatly reduce complexity and increase reliability by eliminating the need for active cooling. In cases utilizing liquid cooling, the PCM heat sink can eliminate the need for a cold plate, pumps, valves, etc. A second common application is for protection against momentary failure. In this case, there is a primary coolant loop 
but reliability issues or potential power loss causes the need for a secondary system that can avoid failure during momentary issues. In this case, while the primary coolant is functioning, the PCM module will be in solid state, and when the coolant is lost, the PCM will melt and absorb the heat load until the primary system is functioning again. This type of system has very similar design considerations as a one-time use application. The final application is for a heat source with a pulsed or duty cycle operation. In this case, the PCM is used as a heat exchanger that dampens the high peak loads and allows the ultimate heat sink to be designed for average heat load. This application provides significant weight and volume reductions for pulse mode operating systems. The key takeaways we hope you learn is that PCM can be an effective way to store thermal energy or reduce heat sink size for pulse mode operation. The PCM material selection is primarily dependent on power and time, although component operating and boundary conditions must also be considered. And finally, the internal design of these systems is critical to their performance. The two big design considerations are one, ensuring a proper conduction path to and from the PCM to accommodate its typically poor thermal conductivity, and two, making sure the module structure is robust enough to handle internal pressure changes result, resulting from the phase transitions. Today we reviewed three very different thermal management technologies, heat pipes, pump two-phase cooling, and PCM thermal storage. Each provides excellent thermal management solutions for selected applications. Heat pipes are superconductors of heat. They provide completely passive heat transfer and heat spreading. Used mostly for electronics cooling applications, heat pipes are rugged and reliable devices that are ubiquitous from laptop computers to satellites. For more demanding heat flux requirements, a technology that is finding increasing commercial adoption is pump two-phase cooling. Pump two-phase cooling takes benefit of the latent heat of vaporization and is designed to have the working fluid move from single phase to two phase as it passes across the heat source. Compared to the more conventional pump liquid systems, P2P offers significant power and weight savings. P2P systems also provide greater heat flux dissipation capability while offering tighter isothermal performance. PCM heat sinks can temporarily absorb high amounts of waste heat without increasing its temperatures. These solutions are being used to reduce overall heat sink size and provide temporary thermal management when the active cooling solution may not be operable. We hope that by providing overviews of these thermal management solutions, we have given some insight as to when they may be applicable for your thermal management challenges. Thank you, and now we'll turn it back to Billy for some questions. Thanks, Pete. At this time, we'd like to begin our Q&A. I'd like to welcome Rich Bonner to the line. Rich is Manager of Custom Products at ACT. Rich, this question, uh, oh, and if you have a question, you may submit it by entering it in the box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Rich, our first question here came in early. It was, uh, are heat pipes pressurized? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I guess the, the short answer is sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. Um, really, I think the a better question is what is the pressure inside of a heat pipe? Um, in a heat pipe, you really have nothing in there other than uh, the working fluid without any non-condensable gas. So the pressure inside the heat pipe is equal to the saturation of the saturation pressure or the vapor pressure of that working fluid at whatever temperature it's operating at. So if we use water as an example, everyone's you know aware that the the normal boiling point is about 100 degrees C. So if you're using a heat pipe in, atmosphere, in, you know, in the atmosphere, if you're over 100 C, the vapor pressure of water uh, over 100 C is greater than one atmosphere, the heat pipe will be under pressure. If you're under 100 degrees C, you'll actually be operating in a, in a vacuum condition, so it would be negative pressure. Billy? Rich, what are the biggest challenges in implementing pumped two-phase cooling systems? I think the biggest challenge in pump two-phase systems is really comes down to the design. I mean, if you compare it to a single-phase system, you, you have more variables, more issues. Uh, some of those issues might be critical heat flux, uh, dry out, uh, more complicated pressure drop and heat transfer modeling that's required. Um, uh, some people might ask the question, why, 
if pump two phase is so great, why aren't we doing it all the time? I think it's it's really because of that complicated uh, design process that's often required. But of course, just to, you know, not to um, push aside what Pete just presented, obviously if you can get through that design work, there's a lot of benefits to pump two phase in terms of overall performance and, and cost of production systems. This will have to be our last question today. How do you deal with the low thermal conductivity of paraffin waxes when designing PCM heat sinks with them? Right, that's really the, the main design issue that we encounter when designing PCM systems, uh, you know, getting around that low thermal conductivity. We have a lot of options that we can do. Uh, really, the solution that takes form depends on the heat flux that you're operating at and also the total amount of power that you're trying to store. Uh, for smaller, lower heat flux systems, uh, simple fins or even just the you know, metal casings that you're holding the PCM in is, is probably enough to isothermalize it. Uh, for larger systems, we can go to more complicated fin structures, foams, and even heat pipes to uh, help get heat into the PCMs. Thanks, Rich. We'll end it there. That concludes today's webcast. Again, if we did not get a chance to answer your question, our sponsors will do their best to address them after today's presentation. So our thanks to Pete Ritt, Rich Bonner, and everyone out there for joining us. And just a reminder, this webcast will be available on demand at www.techbriefs.com for the next 12 months. Have a great day.